signed in and uh, are we good to go there? Okay, so we, uh, we are excited. They lead the London Church, do a fabulous job serving as an evangelist and an elder Mohan in the church in London. So without further ado, let's jump into our class. The, uh, the passage is uh, coming out of Haggai, uh, chapter 2, verse 4. And the uh, charge is, so get to work, Zerubbabel, God is speaking. Get to work, Joshua, son of Jehozadab, the priest. Get to work, all you people, God is speaking. A century ago, a band of brave souls became known as one-way missionaries. They purchased single tickets to the mission field without the return half. And instead of suitcases, they packed their few earthly belongings into coffins, and they sailed out of port, and they waved goodbye to everyone they loved, everything they knew. They knew that they were never returning home. A.W. Myling was one of those missionaries. He set sail for new brides in the South Pacific, knowing full well that headhunters lived there. They had martyred every missionary before them. Milner did not fear for his life, however, because, you see, he had already died to himself. His coffin was packed. For 35 years, he lived among that tribe and loved them. When he died, tribe members buried him in the middle of their village and inscribed this epitaph on his tombstone. When he came, there was no light. When he left, there was no darkness. What do you want inscribed on your tombstone? You know, one of my favorite quotes from Mark Twain is simply the two most important days in your life are the day you were born and the day you find out why. Wow. <laughs> you know, the bottom line is, this is a class about the need to get to work. The task before us is immense. All you have to do is get on a flight from Dallas, Texas, halfway on the other side of the world, and fly for 19 hours straight and land in Hong Kong to know that we've not even begun to finish the work before us. It's so exciting to see the purpose that God has given us. And I think, you know, really in this class, we were asked to touch on the fact that it really shouldn't matter what your title is, whether you have a title, what your role is, or regardless of your age in life. I'm looking down on the front row, and I see people in here who are close to 70. And I look at the row behind them, and I see others who are in their 20s. And uh, you can figure out who you are, I'm sure. But really, I think we can really get caught up in, you know, we, we've done our time, we've, we've, we've lived our dream, and now we're going to kind of coast on into retirement. Or, you know, I'm too young to really take on a great task for God, and I have no title, I have no role. Listen, my hero right now in the Bible is Caleb. Caleb, you know Caleb. But you know, the older you get, the more you appreciate a guy like Caleb. Caleb, who said in Joshua 14, verse 12, Now then, just as the Lord promised, he has kept me alive for 45 years. 
Since the time he said this to Moses, while Israel moved about in the wilderness. So here I am today, 85 years old. I am still as strong today as the day Moses sent me out. I am just as vigorous to go out to battle now as I was then. Now give me this hill country that the Lord promised me that day. You yourselves heard that the Amalekites were there and their cities were large and fortified. But the Lord helping me, I will drive them out just as he said. You know, I've had the opportunity many times in the States to share about a hobby that I had growing up. And my hobby was rock climbing. And I would love to, uh, you know, take on some of the more challenging cliffs and, and uh, uh, hills in, in the area where we lived. And I would go to Colorado and I had an opportunity to, to go rock climbing in Colorado when I was in high school where there are many mountains. And one of the things I learned about rock climbing is that there are numerous times in that climb of maybe 200 or 300 uh, feet straight up that you're going to get to a point in a rock climb where you don't have a handhold or you, you don't have a foothold and, and, and you've got a choice. The choice is you can either just stay there for the rest of your life <laughs> or you can make your commitment move as they call it and, and, and launch on up and just pray that there's a handhold up there or something to grab onto as you make your move. But the one choice you don't have in rock climbing is to go back down. It's way harder to go down, almost impossible, than it is to climb up where you don't see. I think if we ever get this into our mindset as a disciple and really embed it in our heart, it would be amazing what that would do to propel our growth and our heart towards the mission of Christ. You see, there's a point in that rock climb where the guy who is belaying you at the top of that cliff will sense that the rope is not moving. And usually what you're going to hear in a situation like that from the guy belaying you up there is he's going to yell down at you, don't bogart. That's a term that means you're, you're standing still. You're not moving. And I think sometimes God is yelling down to us, stop bogarting. Make your commitment move. You know, I don't care how old you get in Christ, you still need to make commitment moves in your life. For my wife and I, we served in the ministry for some 20 three years, 22 years. And in 2003, we stepped out of the ministry and for seven years built successful careers in the business world. I have to tell you, I got a fair amount of fulfillment out of that career. But it was amazing how in my mindset I realized that I still long to have a life that had an eternal purpose, a life that had an eternal impact. We, uh, we started leading a family group, and the family group grew and grew and grew to the point where probably could have been a sector. But I realized that I was getting more satisfaction out of leading a married family ministry than I was in selling real estate. Now, for many years, I tried to deny it, but in my heart, I still felt like, you know, is, is this really what my life is all about? And I would get up in the morning, I would get ready, and I would look at the mirror, and I would be haunted by John 21, where Jesus says, do you love me more than these? After the, uh, after the crucifixion, when Peter was there fishing again, you remember John 21. 
And uh, I finally got to the point where I had to be honest with my own heart. And I had to cry out to God. And I said, God, make it clear what you want me to do. Now, at that time in my life, I had two children who had not yet been baptized. And that was heavy on my heart because they were now in their young 20s. My older son had become a disciple, but my younger two had not been baptized. And the most amazing thing happened when we made the decision to go back in the ministry at the age of 54. We, uh, we went to a seminar, one of the IOCs just like this in Denver, and the most amazing thing happened, we decided to go back in the ministry but not tell our children because they were all living at home and we knew it would freak them out. Because we knew we were making a decision to move out of a ministry that we had been a part of for 20 years in Los Angeles. Within one month of coming back and making that decision, independently and unknown to us, our daughter asked to study the Bible with the women's ministry leader. Our son went up to another brother and said, hey, would you teach me the Bible? They did not even tell themselves, each other, what they were doing. And five months after we made that decision, our daughter and our son were baptized into Christ before we even went back on the mission field. And I just share that with you before Connie comes up to say this. I am absolutely convinced that the things that hold us back, the things we worry about, are the things that God says, listen, I'll take care of that. You just make your commitment move. And I believe that was a powerful way of God telling me, listen, you take care of my family and I'll take care of yours. And God has never failed to let me down or to, uh, to, to disappoint me. And, and so I really want you to think about that as you think about the commitment move God is calling you to make in your life. Wow, wow this is an amazing crowd and what an incredible conference that we've all taken part in. I said... What else is there left to be said? It's been so amazing. We have feel like a sponge that's soaking up so many great things this week. But I just wanted to uh, tag along with what Mark shared. I think many of us in this room, you, you are mission-minded. That's why you're here. You wouldn't be at this conference if you weren't. And yet at different points in our life, we can be more mission-minded than others. And um, I remember as a very young Christian, uh, hearing the, the saying, being willing to go anywhere, to be willing to do anything, and to be willing to give up everything. And I remember those missionaries who left the United States literally with one suitcase. That's it. That's all they were taking with them on the mission field. And what an admirable thing to do. And we stood back and watched that happening on a regular basis among all of us. But now we've grown and we've matured and that's more, you know, a memory than it is an actuality where we're making those kind of commitment moves to, to change our lives, to make a big step, to step out on faith and trust God with our heart and our life. And when Mark referred back to um, just almost four years ago when we stepped back into the ministry, I just want to say, as a woman, I was terrified. And if you, if you are not sure about the mission, do not marry a guy like this, because he has dragged me all over the place, you know? Just kidding. Love every minute of it. But, you know, I remember as a very young Christian coming home, Mark and I were leading our very first campus ministry, and I was willing to do that walked in the front door and through the whole apartment are books laying wide open and the books were all about canada and i'm like why is my what is going on he's not taking a class but there was just probably 12 books so when he got home i'm like what are you doing about canada and he's he's like i have an idea we need, there's too many Christians in the United States. We need to get out of here 
and go where the word hasn't been heard. So, you know, I should have thought about this more carefully before I married this man, but I've been along for the ride, but occasionally he's had to drag me along a little. So when, four years ago, when this decision came, I could watch my husband, and I knew the calling was on his heart. And I can honestly say it wasn't on my heart in the same way that it was on his heart. And I could not stand in the way of what God was calling him to do. And I needed to get out of the way. But that commitment move was super, super scary for me, super uncomfortable. I hated the thought of leaving everything that I had become familiar with and comfortable with, my best friends in the world, and yet I knew it was what we needed to do. And so my encouragement to you is to ask yourself today, when was the last time you made a commitment move that puts you in a terribly uncomfortable position? Because I know we live in the States and it's easy, breezy, but moving across country, leaving our children, starting standing in front of a region of 300 people and we didn't know one single person, wow. it was scary. And so I just want to call upon all of us to be willing to make those scary decisions, to be willing to put ourselves in uncomfortable positions because as you know and I know, that's when our growth is the greatest yeah. spiritually, is when we put the mission first, our comfort second, and we go for it and make our commitment move. I just want to say that uh, the hunger for the mission is something that uh, many times you're going to have to fight to keep alive in your heart. And, uh, you know, we were in Los Angeles for 20 years in the same region for 20 years. And I think one of the things that is so challenging as we age, and many of us are, as I look around here, aging, is that it gets really challenging to want to move when you are comfortable. You start thinking, I want to be by my grandkids. You know, if we all want to be by our grandkids, then we're not going to evangelize too much of the world, are we? We start thinking about, well, this church has a better retirement program, so I need to be here to take care of my needs. You know, uh, sobering when you think of those one-way missionaries putting their earthly belongings in one coffin, the one coffin challenge. Wow. And I think uh, what, what I would say to this is the absolute best thing we ever did was at age 54 and 55, decide to leave all the comforts that we knew in relationships and security and step out on faith. It was uncomfortable. It was unnerving. And, and, and listen, I, I, I say humbly, compared to what many heroes of ours have done, it was a very small decision. But sometimes the first step is the hardest step. And, and making the first move is the hardest move. And uh, so I don't hold this up as a model of, wow, what sacrifice, what commitment. But I realized that I was stagnant spiritually, that I was even digressing spiritually. And yet when we made that move and we took over a new ministry and a new city with 7 million people, a new role, a, a role that uh, we had to learn and grow into, working hand in hand with the Assads and the staff in Dallas and, and not worrying about who got the credit, whether you're going to be the lead evangelist or on the senior ministry team or not even on the team or whatever the role. You know, there comes a point where you're just grateful to be back in the ministry. And you're just grateful to have a second chance. And, and I am so thankful to have had that second chance. And if some of you are out there thinking about, you know, I, I, I look back on my last six months, my last... Uh, year or my last two years and you can say I know I'm not where I need to be I know I'm stagnant think about what your commitment move is it may not be moving to another city but it may be going up to your church leader and saying I am ready to move in the city I live in and go to a pocket where we don't have disciples 
Dallas is 7 million people. We're on a mission field in our city. Uh, we're making a move in, in, in six weeks to a place where there are no disciples living in the metroplex of Dallas. We've already met seven, eight different neighbors in our immediate neighborhood, and we haven't even moved in yet because we're going with the mindset to be in the mission. We're going with the mindset that we want to make a difference. We've been praying over the house we bought, saying, God, give us souls here who are searching. Lead us to the open hearts. We're laying a plan to have hospitality. We have great examples in Dallas of people who have had people into their homes and over months and years of just taking pies by and having others in have really uh, made an impact on winning neighbors to Christ. So make your commitment move today. Don't bogart. It will be the best decision you ever made. Amen. Thanks so much, Mark and Connie. I remember as a uh, young single evangelist visiting the Toronto church and uh, speaking at a packed midweek when you guys had been there just a year or two. I can't even remember. And uh, seeing the fruit of your work. And uh, it is just such a joy to be sharing the class with you and to hear your story. And uh, their story is the same as our story. So you're going to hear it twice. But uh, it's great to be here. The, the first time Helen and I spoke as a couple in Singapore was right after we'd been married and we were introduced as Mohan and Helen De Silva. That's because Helen is a daughter of your country and therefore I'm just a son-in-law of Singapore. But uh, let's go ahead and turn in our Bibles to 2 Corinthians 5. We're gonna, we have a very similar story to Mark and Connie. We had been in the ministry. We got out of the ministry. It took a lot of soul searching to go back into the full-time ministry when we were invited to. And um, I'm going to share some verses that meant a lot to us along our way and that convicted us and some thoughts that hopefully are useful for you. Um, you know, we heard a couple of days ago, I think it was Sam who shared that in Haggai 2.4, which Mark read earlier, um, three times um, the temple builders are encouraged to take courage. You know, um, to, to, to be courageous, to be strong, to not be fearful, to not be discouraged, to not worry, to not be anxious. These are exhortations that appear over and over and over again in the Bible. And uh, the reason why is very simple. We can all identify with it. It's because if you're like me, the thing that goes so easily on a daily basis is my courage. And uh, so that's why the Bible calls us to have that kind of courage. Where does it come from? What do we need to think about? Well, for me, one of the things that was important and, and is important is to remember the cross. In 2 Corinthians 5, there's a couple of verses that you know well. We use them often, but they mean a lot to me. Uh, verse 18 says, All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. A very simple point. You know, you know, you know you've got to ask yourself the question, who is the us that's been reconciled to God in Christ. Well, the us um, is all Christians and everyone who's going to be a Christian. We've been reconciled to God in Christ. Therefore, who is the us who's been given the ministry of reconciliation? Well, it's the same us. You know, at times in my life when I've been tempted to say someone else should put up their hand to do this job that's being asked of me, this verse really convicts me because, you know, it doesn't matter whether you're a full-time worker or, you know, a part-time worker or you're a student or have a full-time job or in any other station of life. If you've been reconciled to God in Christ, then you have the ministry of reconciliation and you are an ambassador of Christ. That's one of the things that's convicted me along the way. 
you know, um, in responding to the cross, you know, then it just totally makes sense that regardless of your age or your title or your role, you should be totally committed to that ministry, to whatever's being asked of you to do, to whatever God is calling you to do, no matter how big or no matter how small. You know, we also heard a couple of days ago from um, Robert Carrillo in his excellent, you know, talk on Zechariah about how um, Zechariah says to the people, you know, they're, they're looking at the, um, actually in Ezra as well, they're looking at the foundation of the new temple and it seems so miserable and puny compared to what had been there before. And, and Zechariah says, you know, don't despise the day of small things. Yes. You know, um, embracing the cross, embracing the ministry of reconciliation means cherishing even the small things that God gives you to do. Yeah, yeah. When we moved back to London with, with, with great hesitancy, and Helen will share more of our story and, and all that, um, you know, one of the things, we moved to a ministry where there were, where there, we had been invited actually at that point, just by the, the London church was divided and we were invited by the church that was in West London. And there were just 50 people there and the Bible discussion leaders had lost a lot of confidence and there were open people to study the Bible with, but there was not a lot of confidence. We spent the first few weeks getting to know everybody. Then we started to lead a Bible discussion where there were five women plus me. Wow. And my 14-year-old son, Rahul, was my male visitor. Wow. You know, God worked, you know, and we'd been, one of the things we'd been invi- advised was, you're going from a church in New Delhi that has a decent teen ministry to a church in London where things are pretty broken, this is not the time of life to be moving in. But there were other people who told us, well, you know, it, respond to the call and God will bless you. As we remembered the cross, you know, we felt like there is a need and it might be sin for us to not accept this call. But, we, you know, we, we embraced that little Bible discussion and um, God worked in a powerful way. Soon thereafter, in the first couple of months, a lady named um, Lalu was baptized and her husband Bola was restored. Um, at the end of the year, Zorro, there really is a brother whose name is Zorro. <laughs> he was baptized in December and in January his parents, Arsen and Karina, were restored. A few months later, his sister Ellen was baptized. And a few months after that, his girlfriend Katya, with whom he had broken up to become a Christian, she was baptized. And um, in 2011, this was 2009-10, in 2011, they started dating again and last year, they were, you know, pretty broke, but they had a fabulous wedding in our house. Amen. In the course of the first three years that we were there, there were 18 people baptized or restored in our one little Bible discussion. That brought a lot of faith. That's okay. <laughs> Applaud for God. But, you know, you know, that brought a lot of faith. In, um, a couple of years ago, we merged two of the regions of the church, and in our new combined region last year... In 2013, we had, um, I don't know, 21, 22 people added. But the thing that really excited us was they were spread across 17 family groups out of the 20 or so family groups that were there. In other words, we saw how the Bible talk leaders picked up faith, I believe because we had remembered the cross and cherished the small thing that God gave us to do. Yeah. Are you embracing your role with courage? No matter your title, no matter your age, no matter what God gives you to do. Secondly, um, remember the call. I'm going to share a verse with you that's a little unusual, but it's always, or for a long time, it's convicted me. It's in Hebrews 12, and uh, it's a funny little verse in verse 16, where it says, um, See that no one is sexually immoral or is godless like Esau, who for a single meal sold his inheritance rights, as the oldest son. Now you say, what in the world are you doing preaching out of that verse? What does this have to do with anything? Well, you know, the story of Esau in the Old Testament that this refers to is a very convicting one for me. Esau was the firstborn in, uh, you know, just by a couple of minutes maybe from his twin brother Jacob. And as such, he had the rights of the firstborn. The firstborn in that culture received the double portion of the inheritance but was also responsible for carrying on his father's name and reputation in Israel. And along with that went responsibility because you see in the Bible, a calling always goes with responsibility. 
That's why sometimes, frankly, I'm nervous about accepting a calling. Because I know it's going to come with a responsibility. And the story is that Esau came in one day, he was absolutely famished from being out hunting, and he was so hungry that for the sake of a single meal, he gave up his inheritance. He gave up his inheritance rights. Okay? He gave up his calling as the firstborn. And this verse says he was godless. His godlessness, his completely non-God-centered attitude was manifested in the fact that for convenience, out of short-term gratification, you know, out of a need to just eat at that moment, he rejected and despised the calling of God in his life. This is a verse that as I was thinking about my own life a few years ago, I thought, you know, Mohan, don't be godless. Don't be godless. You know, if you're being asked, then you need to consider prayerfully. And you need to respond to a need and a calling. Amen. I've now shared a few things, but now I need to let you hear the truly useful things from the truly spiritual half of our marriage. That daughter of Singapore, right. Helen, not De Silva, yeah. Nanjundai. Good morning. It's so great to be back here in Singapore. I owe so much to the church here and uh, just the vision and the dream to go into the full time ministry. That's where it all started, right here in Singapore. Uh, by nature, I am someone who is quite selective in being courageous. Uh, as a young woman, I had a tremendous amount of courage uh, to um, excel in my studies, uh, in my career. And, uh, you know, being a Singaporean, I am one of those kiasu Singaporean. <laughs> and translated, you know, the word kiasu means you don't want to fall behind. You want to keep up with everybody. And so, you know, people here have to show a lot of courage just to keep up with everybody else. But when it came to matters of the kingdom, I was not very courageous. I can think of several times in my Christian life where I lacked courage. One was giving up my job here in Singapore and going into the full-time ministry, that took a lot of prayer, a lot of encouragement, and uh, finally, I did that. Another was giving up, living here and moving to India as a single. That was hard. That took a lot of courage, and I'm so grateful for the people who encouraged me, uh, for God answering my prayers and giving me the courage to do that. Another was following this crazy man that I married <laughs> who has a crazy love for Jesus and who took me all over the world and I had to be courageous and to pray a lot just to be his helper. And I hope I have done a good job with that. <laughs> and uh, then uh, another scary time in my life was when we had to move to London to do the ministry there. I was really fearful, anxious, faithless, did not always believe that God will be with me. And that was an area that I really needed to repent of. And you know what? London was the greatest training ground for me to repent of that area of my life. And uh, you know, the church there needed a lot of rebuilding. There was faithlessness, apathy, discouragement, hurt, and uh, people were feeling a lot of things. So five years ago, when Mohan and I moved to London, we were the only couple, husband and wife, serving in the full-time ministry there. I was the only woman on staff going to staff meetings with the brothers. Wow. It took a lot of prayers, encouragement, support from those who were faithful. Uh, people prayed for us. 
and uh, we had to learn to be faithful and persevere. The work was a difficult one. Many times I wanted to quit. I had to pray and study out books like Nehemiah and Haggai, memorize scriptures, and uh, try and overcome fear and discouragement. I am in the sixth decade of my life right now, and I didn't think that I needed to beat myself up to rebuild the women's ministry in London. It was very challenging. But I decided that I really need to, needed to believe that God has uh, placed my husband and me in that situation for a reason. And uh, uh, with the help of God, with encouragement and support from my brothers and sisters and from my husband, I was able to change my attitude and try and, uh, you know, uh, uh, overcome whatever discouragement that I was going through. You know, discouragement is a common response to the challenges of life. Yes. Even David, who experienced great spiritual yes. triumphs, had a tremendous, had tremendous emotional struggles. You can read that in the book of Psalms, you know. And uh, it is something that is universal. Almost everyone has been discouraged at some point in their lives. It is something that's recurring. Yeah. You may overcome discouragement this week and only to face it again next week. It can be contagious, so you, can, you have to watch out for those who want to pull you down by indulging in negativity or self-pity. It can be unpredictable. You never know when it will strike you or your loved one. And the good thing is, it's temporary. It will pass if you respond correctly. Discouragement is different from disappointment. When our expectations are not met, we feel disappointed. But discouragement is a feeling of despair and despondency. It's a choice. We can choose to remain dejected or determined to work through our feelings and overcome them and go back to work. Yeah. Are you discouraged today? What are the causes? Can you identify them? Our attitude is our choice. You know, uh, I, I, I can think of how um, a group of women totally, totally decided in London to not to give in to fear, discouragement, to not give in to worry or be bitter or overwhelmed and put the past behind them. Today, I'm not the only woman on staff in London. Amen. I'd like to share some of the courage some of these women have shown who were in the full-time ministry, they went out to rebuild their lives, build amazing careers, but they decided to respond to the call and come back to work for the Lord. Amen. I think about my sister, Julie D'Souza, who was in the ministry for a long time. And she went back, she, was, she, was, she came out of the ministry in 2003 because of all the problems there. She built an amazing career as a, as a head teacher. And she and her husband, Mike D'Souza, came back into the ministry to build the East region of the London church. I think of another sister, Bola. She was also in the ministry for a long time, came out of the ministry, had a successful career in the civil service. She and her husband, Tokes, came back to the ministry to build the southeast part of London. I think of another sister, Pat Elikiu, who had a, who was in the ministry before, but had a very successful career as a senior teacher. And she and her husband came back into the ministry to build the northern region of the London church. Awesome. I think of another couple, Angela and Corey Stuck, who were leading the church in Richmond in the USA. They moved to London together with their three children two years ago to rebuild the south part of the London church. I think of the Hinkles who were in the church in Virginia, a very young couple, came to take up their first ministry job in London two years ago to build our campus ministry and we're very grateful for them. Tammy Fleming, and a sister called um, uh, Maggie, 
they are building the ministry in the northern part of the UK. Not only that, this year, three more women came back into the ministry. A woman called Nadine, Walter, and uh, 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 Nadine, and she used to be the ministry in Jamaica, yeah. and she has now just came back into the full-time ministry this wow. month with her husband. Amen. I think about Jackie, a woman in her late 50s, a very successful architect. She and her husband, uh, Roger, never been in the ministry before, both in their late 50s, came back into the ministry and has gone to lead the church in Leicester. I think of Joe and Mulligan Price, who just came into the ministry this month. They're going to Belfast to build that part of the ministry. Not only that, this year we have six young women wow. from all over America, wow. Australia, yeah. and the UK, who has come to do a one-year challenge. I am so grateful for all these women from having no women's ministry today every region of the london church have full-time ministry staff they are all trying to teach other women and to raise up the younger generation and i'm so grateful for them sisters my encouragement to you is don't give in to fear God has great plans for you. And sisters who are married, pray for your husband and trust that God will work through your husband's leadership to build the church. And uh, I am so, so grateful to all of you. I know that you are here because you want to do something for God, regardless of your age, your stage in life, and I know that God can do great things through you. Thank you. Awesome. Let's just close with a prayer. Will you bow your heads with me? Our God and Father, we are so grateful today for the gifts of life and of salvation, God. Uh, Lord, you provide for us so incredibly generously. And um, God, it's just so amazing to be in a hotel like this and uh, to have the privilege, God, and the opportunity and the resources uh, to take part in a conference like this. Um, and God, we're grateful for, for the things that we take for granted every single day. God, the way you provide uh, just food and water and shelter. And uh, God, truly, you've, you've blessed us to overflowing, Father. And um, Father, I'm so convicted to God by the fact that those who have received much, God, from them much is also expected, Father. Lord, uh, every single one of us has received so much, God. And uh, Father, especially just to be able to have a relationship with you where you provide for us so meticulously and carefully every single day of our lives and in every single need, Father. Uh, God, uh, help us never, never take that for granted. Lord, I appreciate every brother and sister who's in this room. God, whatever their situation, God, whatever it is that they're struggling with, whatever decision they're wrestling with, whatever call they're wrestling with that they need to embrace. Father, I pray, God, that today you will help us to seek your face and to find it, God. I pray, God, that as we talk to one another, God, we will hear your voice. I pray, God, that you will give us the courage that you promise when we surrender to you and are willing to have an attitude that says, not my will, but yours be done. Father, I pray that you will help us put our arms around each other, God, and spur one another on. Thank you so much for Mark and Connie and for their story and for their courage and for their simple faith and for their willingness to serve anywhere and for the way that you blessed even their family as a result, God. Father, thank you, God, for the great victories that Helen and I have been blessed to see, Father, through the years. And I pray that these simple things that you've allowed us to share will be a blessing to those whom you sent here today, Father, to hear this message. We love you, God, we cherish you, we praise you, we pray these things in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much.